This video contains plot spoilers for the game, Hyrule Warriors. I have never ceased to be amazed by some people's ability to stick to a narrative no matter what. Everything they hear or see is filtered through their victimization prism, either rejecting it outright or distorting it in such a way to suit their preconceived bias. And the articles I'm about to show you are perfect examples of that. I purchased a Wii last year with a couple of games, including Hyrule Warriors. For those of you who are not familiar with the game, there is a long-running series called Dynasty Warriors. Despite the fact that I have both the first and the eighth in the Dynasty Warriors series, I have never played any of their games. From what I understand, most of them involve a hack-and-slash battle style against hordes of enemies. Hyrule Warriors is a game designed in the style of Dynasty Warriors, but using characters, items, and a story based on the Legends of Zelda series. I really like the game. I have been a fan of the Legends of Zelda series since the early 90s, but I have always been frustrated with the time-wasting, long, boring side quests. Hyrule Warriors included a story that, while being unique and enjoyable enough, certainly felt like a Legend of Zelda story. However, the extra content, the balanced gameplay, the tight controls, the wide array of characters, and the special moves are what really made it one of my favorite 8th generation games so far. Unfortunately, my time watching and making videos has made it impossible for me to enjoy anything without finding something trivial that feminists will complain about. So I did a quick Google search and the feminists did not disappoint. In fact, as you will soon see, they far exceeded my expectations. I am going to skip the first few paragraphs, they just complain about games such as Assassin's Creed, Divinity, and other games that have already been talked about to death on YouTube and Twitter. Basically any female character that shows some skin is sexism, you know, the drill. She ends her introduction angry about Nintendo being praised for having more strong female characters when, in her opinion, they're all terrible characters. Let's find out what makes her so upset over Hyrule Warriors. Hyrule Warriors looks to be an interesting game, truth be told. Based on the sort of epic combats that are characteristic of the Dynasty Warriors series, it has you fighting battles on a grand scale. Further, the cast of characters seems pretty well divided with half of the 12 main characters being female. Okay, we have some female characters. Lana is a main character that is unique to this game. Zelda, of course. Midna? She's not a main character. She does have some important parts in three of the levels, but she's only playable in two levels in Legend Mode. Agatha? She's even less important. There are some time travel elements to this game. You have to travel back to earlier games in the series. It's a plot device used to expand the cast of characters to include those from the games Ocarina of Time, Skyward Sword, and Twilight Princess. We have Sia, whom the author refers to as Shia for some reason. I actually did not like this character, and actually agree with one of her criticisms, which I will get to later. Sia is the main villain for most of the game. The other two villains are males who are subservient to her, besides Ganondorf, of course. Next, we have Impa, who also apparently is reincarnated just like Link and Zelda are. And then we have what she calls the six principal male characters. Volga is Sia's main battle commander. Zant Zant? Damn it. Zant isn't a main character. He is the villain of one of the Twilight Princess levels. He is later brought back to life by Ganondorf in the epilogue, but really has nothing to the plot. Next we have Link, who needs no explanation. Second row we... wait. Argorok? 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 The one level boss monster from Twilight Princess is a main male character? Sure, why not? While we're at it, let's add the King Dodongo, Goma, Man Handla, the Imprisoned, oh hell, throw in the Gibdos, the Rededs, Darknuts, Moblins. Damn, there are so many more main male characters than I realize. Yeah, sure, most of these are just generic enemies and are not even given a gender, but who cares? We have a narrative to support. <sighs> Moving on. Lizro is the other main villain who supports Sia. Wow, not off to a good start, are we? Not pictured with the male characters, the obligatory Ganondorf. Now, there are some positive things here. 
It's nice that Zelda is a playable character and actually doesn't get backbenched for this title. Also, it is nice that female characters account for half the main characters. However, there are some serious issues that come up when you start looking more in depth in the character design. By looking in more depth at the character design, you mean nitpick over non-issues and things you do not understand or don't personally like, I'm guessing. For example, the range of designs of the female characters is incredibly constricted, with all of the six main female characters being either pretty, cute, or sexy. Um... Really? Giggling Cat Imp is pretty cute or sexy? What about Impa? She's mostly covered up, and but she's not ugly. Is it sexist because she doesn't have an eating disorder or a burned face or something? I, I, I'm not getting what standard you are setting. And there are other characters beyond the six you've highlighted. Princess Ruto and Fee are not main characters, but they have much bigger impact than Agatha. Is Air Swimming Fish Girl and Blue Sword Lady just pretty cute or sexy eye candy for the male gaze. But when you look at the not-female characters, the range is so much wider. You have a slim youth, mysterious warrior, an inhuman monster, a horrific shade, and whatever the hell Ganondorf is. He's a Gerudo demon, dammit. Do your research. Let's look at the actual main characters divided by gender. Now, let us add some of the secondary characters. You think all of these female characters are less diverse than the male characters? Yeah, there is no female version of Wizro, but if you do not see the diversity in these characters, then that is because you do not really know what diversity is. Each of these characters has very different designs, personalities, weapons, attack styles, and backstories. But you cannot see any of that because the women have too much skin showing, you think Volga is ugly, and you think that a one-level boss monster with no dialogue is a main character. So in the Zelda universe, there are super attractive male characters, and monstrous male characters, and something in between, but there is literally no such thing as an unattractive female character. Because even in a universe where single characters can defeat entire armies, it is unbelievable that the heroic woman might also be unattractive. <laughs> She's literally upset that the women are too pretty. Let's see if this clears a few things up. Why don't we arrange these characters in a different way? Protagonists and antagonists. If you ignore these three non-Hyrulean protagonists, like you did earlier, most of the youthful, attractive characters you mentioned earlier are on the protagonist side. Only Sia is on the antagonist side. Why are not our heroes unattractive? Because this is a fantasy where our protagonists are supposed to be strong, powerful looking, and confident. The antagonists, on the other hand, are supposed to look dark and evil. We are not supposed to like them at all. They are designed to make us want to beat the crap out of them. All of these characters succeeded that, even Sia. But Sia also has some tragic elements to her backstory. How do you not understand this? Do you even play video games? Also, it's important to note that there are some super problematic character designs going on here. Most notably, Shia. Ugh, it's Sia. Sia! She's got gravity-defying nipple sphere boobs, improbable costuming, decorative armor plating that protects literally nothing while vital bits of anatomy are exposed, pointy metal objects stabbing her directly in the boob. Christ, it would be easier to find things they didn't get wrong. What the hell happened to Nintendo's reputation as a family-friendly game publisher? Honestly, I did not really care for Sia's character in this game. It is one of the few downsides to Hyrule Warriors, but that is not because I have anything against sexualized characters. I just think she did not fit this game. There are games when that type of thing is fitting. Juliet Sterling in Lollipop Chainsaw was sexualized because a cheerleader flipping through the air dismembering zombies with her boyfriend's talking head hanging from her belt is funny. Get it? But let us compare that to one of my favorite 6th generational games, Silent Hill 3. Both the primary antagonist and primary protagonists are women. Neither Heather nor Claudia are sexualized at all, and it would have been inappropriate and ill-fitting to the themes and the tone of this game if they had been. But wait, it gets worse. Shia's entire backstory is that she was once a guardian of the Triforce until she fell in love with Link, and her jealousy of Zelda made her get all evil and stuff. This is actually the one thing I agree with. 
The backstory of Sia turning evil due to jealousy over Link and Zelda is a lazy and simplistic story, and it does not make sense. None of the incarnations of Zelda and Link have ever had a romantic relationship. The running theme throughout every generation has always been Link is the reincarnation of the hero, the brave warrior of ages, the holder of the Triforce of Courage, and Princess Zelda is the reincarnation of the Goddess of Hyrule, trusted and beloved ruler, the holder of the Triforce of Wisdom. She risks her life to prevent the forces of evil from obtaining the Triforce and to support Link through his battle against evil. Even in this game, there is no romantic relationship at all. But this has nothing to do with sexism, it's just a bad character choice. Right, because the only motivation that ever exists for female characters is a man. And the reason she's dressed like that is because she's evil. And what better way to show that than to have her dress provocatively? Because, you know, sexy women's equals evil. What the hell are you talking about? I have literally played hundreds of games, and I do not think I have played a single one that contained a female antagonist whose primary, secondary, or tertiary motivation was based on jealousy. Depressingly, Zelda honestly isn't much better than the train wreck that she is. Sure, her design looks cool at first blush, but let's look at it in more detail. Oh jeez, what the hell am I reading? She has a diagram pointing out every single patch of visible skin on Zelda's body. No pants? Duh, she's wearing a dress, and most of her legs are covered. Cleavage? Side boob? What are you talking about? You can barely see her breasts. And how do you know that the cloth of her dress does not extend under the breastplate? Actually, you know what is under her breastplate? Nothing! Because she is not real. She is a textured character model controlled by a moveset code. I mean, it's better than Chia's design, but that's not saying a whole hell of a lot. But I guess that is what strong female characters look like these days. Hyrule Warriors development producer had this to say about Zelda's new design. Regarding the look of Zelda herself, she is a ruler. So we want to make sure she is seen as a strong character and that she needs to look like a ruler. She needs to feel like a ruler, Hayashi said. So, she has what you might consider a stronger look for the character. Yeah, she looks real empowered there. What with her armor that prioritizes sexiness over actual protection of vile anatomy, one might even say, regal. Okay, this proves you know nothing about the Legend of Zelda series or about long-running game series in general. Let me replay this clip from my video, Facts vs. Feelings. I can hear the outcries already. But wait, JR, why not design her to look more gender neutral? Because she's always been in her pink dress. She was originally in her pink dress. Just like Mario always has his red shirt and blue overalls and thick mustache. If you change a time-honored and cherished character that we remember from our childhood, you piss off the fan base. Which is the main reason why movies based on video games tend to do so poorly because they divert too far from the source material. How are we gonna get across? I can make it. I, I gotta go feel it. You're not gonna jump? Just do it, come on, just have faith, jump! Just trust, jump, come on! You're not gonna jump? You're Mario, dude. That's literally the only thing you do. Do you see it now? Princess Zelda is not designed to be sexy. She is designed to be easily recognizable as the long-running Nintendo character, but updated to be a warrior. The dress is not revealing. It is an elegant ruler's dress, modified for battle. But the worst, the worst part of this awful Zelda design? Her attack involves her loincloth levitating upward while she pulls glowy energy out of her lady bits to form weapons. I... what? What What the hell am I even reading? Zelda's loincloth? I mean the front part of her dress that's separate from the other part so she can run? Levitates so she can pull 
energy out of her vagina and turn it into weapons. What the what? what? You think that Zelda's rapier special attack animation is designed to sexualize her? I I cannot believe how dedicated you are to your narrative. You are so convinced that you and all women are victimized by depiction of video game characters that you have a hair trigger and cannot not see sexism. It's easy when you look at the world through problematic glasses. You are totally brainwashed. I doubt there is any character that you would not find offensive in some manner. You have to keep building that narrative. Never stop building that narrative! Okay, let's break down this animation. Her dress is not levitating. It is being blown back by wind. In order to make the attack animation more detailed and dynamic, they added wind physics. Why does the front part, or as you call it, the loincloth lift up higher? Perhaps you have heard of the concept of force equaling mass times acceleration? Even if you had not, everyone learns pretty quickly by interacting with the environment that applying equal forces to objects of different mass causes them to move at different speeds. Now, what is being revealed in this less than one second animation? Boots that reach over her knees, almost reaching some rather modest looking heavy shorts. If she was wearing a cherry red thong, I might have agreed with you. What about Agatha? When she performs her parasol attack, her dress is flung out and you can kind of see her bloomers. Does that mean that she is being sexualized as well? This last part, it, it, it's hard for me to find the words to respond to it. It's just so crazy. I just... Alright, I'll just go for it. Those energy glittery things are not coming out of her vagina. They are just appearing in the path that her hands travel. The problem is not these video game characters, or even these video game characters. The problem is with you. You are so hair trigger sensitive that you are feeling attacked on all sides. You cannot look at a situation objectively or in context. Neither are you able to step back and look at video games as a whole and how they have evolved over the decades. You are taking examples on a case-by-case -case divide and conquer style of discussion and blowing them way out of proportion. You are complaining that female characters' costumes are not providing realistic protection, but except for maybe Volga, none of them do. It is not meant to prioritize sexiness over survival. It is prioritizing style over realistic looking battle gear. And do you really think it would be realistic for these magical fantasy people to be performing these physical stunts wearing 55 pounds of plate steel? The only method of pleasing you would be to require the females to look like this. Or maybe this. Look, not all sexualized characters are sexist. Not all characters with exposed skin are sexualized, and sometimes, yes, they pander to the lowest denominator. Unfortunately, it does not get much better from a feminist who had waited until after the game was released to complain about it. Unfortunately, we are not out of the lost woods yet when it comes to damsels in distress. From the opening level of the game, it is very clearly Link who is destined to be the hero. No shit, Sherlock. That is how Legends of Zelda games go. Link is the main hero. The newer generations of consoles with their increased technical resources have allowed later games to have more complex plots than the original 8-bit ones and have such been able to add other warriors to join him. But Link is still the reincarnated hero of the Zelda continuity. That's the way it always has been, that's probably the way it always will be. Link saves both Impa and Zelda from the Dark Forces, even though Impa is far more experienced than Link in combat. Because Link is a reincarnated hero. If he was a weak, clumsy noob, he would not be a compelling character or fun to play. And it was actually Impa that came to the rescue of Link after his first battle with Volga. Why are you ragging on Impa? She's the general of the Hyrulean army. Both of them were saved by the Triforce of Courage.
and Link does not rescue Zelda from Ganondorf. She engages his forces in battle, holding back waves of commanding monsters with increased power while Link and the other characters stop them at their source. She engages Ganondorf while Link gets rescued by the other characters and continues fighting him alone while Link escorts the other characters off the map against the wishes of her general. She continues fighting alone until Link finishes helping the rest of the cast escape, and then Link and Zelda together finish off Ganondorf. You could not have gotten this more wrong if you tried. And honestly, I think you did try. I think you just wanted to find some way to make this sexist. Link also saves a female fairy named Proxy, who serves as his Navi throughout the game. Whoops, spoke too soon. You think that Link rescues Proxy because she's a woman? First off, he does not really rescue her. She gets caught up in the battle at Hyrule Castle, and she takes shelter within his breastplate. Why does she do this? Is it because she is a helpless little girl who needs a man to protect her? Or maybe is it because she's a goddamn three inch tall fairy and has jack shit all to do with her gender, you moron? Proxy was not added to the game as some male power fantasy to protect helpless women. The characters in the game have to communicate with each other during battle. Link never talks. Gee, it sure is boring. He never talks! To get around this character trait, the designers of this game added Proxy, hence her name. The only reason she is female is as a throwback to the character Navi from the Ocarina of Time. Hey, listen! You basically said that! Most of the other female warriors are in dire need of rescuing when they are first introduced. For example, Lana is surrounded by monsters until other heroes show up and rescue her. Really? Let us take a look at the cutscene where Lana gets rescued. So Lana, the leader of the resistance in the Faron Woods, saves a man before the rest of the main characters arrive as backup. They were not even there specifically to find her. They thought that Zelda might be there. Not much else is worth commenting on these articles, but two of the bullet points in the bad section of the second article highlight the ignorance these bloggers have regarding Zelda and video games in general. Some cutscenes are centered around Link, even if playing as another warrior. For example, when Ganondorf is beaten in the final story mission, the cutscenes always show Link standing over him, even if he was actually beaten with Zelda or someone else. You can play as any available character, but there's only one story. Some of those missions center around Link. If you play as someone not part of the story, they will not appear in the cutscenes because they are detached from the gameplay. Even though Zelda being playable was a major selling point, the story only focuses on Link as a main hero. The story does not only focus on Link, not by a long shot. But it would not be a Zelda game if Link was not the hero of Hyrule. It is stuff like this that convinces me that feminists will never ever be happy. They will continue to complain about smaller and smaller issues, blowing things out of proportion, and blatantly misrepresenting non-issues because they live to complain. They live to be offended. They, that's all they want out of life. Seriously, we have people complaining that these characters are not ugly enough and that they promote sexist stereotypes. Even if you ignore all the things that are wrong about these articles, they would still be terrible. All you would have is, hey, look, here's a thing I don't like, therefore it's bad and should go away. Like I said previously, it is all about supporting a narrative. You can twist anything to poison the well any way you want. It's easy, I'll, I'll do it right now. Juliet Sterling is portrayed as a strong and capable young woman who is able to dispatch zombies with relative ease and rescue many other people. Unfortunately, the game designers ruined the entire persona of independence by portraying her as so desperate to save her infected boyfriend that she decapitates him and uses voodoo magic to keep him alive.
From then on, she carries his head around on her as a constant companion. Far from being a strong heroine, Juliet is simply another girl who cannot face a dangerous situation without a man at her side. Why could not have the writers of this game made Juliet emotionally mature and strong enough to let her dying boyfriend go, accepting his death and carrying on alone, stoic and courageous? On the surface, Diablo 3 appears to have a diverse cast of classes, but on closer examination, we find some super problematic issues. The Barbarians are the only class capable of wielding heavy weapons and absorbing immense amounts of damage. But why must toughness be associated with gargantuan size and strength? Why couldn't the Barbarians have been small, weaker people, someone that I could relate to? Commander Deanna Troy is a main character from the series Star Trek The Next Generation. She is the only main character in any of the Star Trek series and movies who is from a species called Betazoid. Troy only manned the helm of the Enterprise twice, in the end of the movies Star Trek Generation and Star Trek Nemesis. Both of these times the Enterprise crashed. Worse yet, in the pilot episode of Star Trek Voyager, Another Betazoid, Lieutenant Stadi, served as the original helmsman. She was unable to maneuver the ship away from an anomaly that not only stranded the ship on the other side of the galaxy, but resulted in the deaths of many crewmen including herself. No other Betazoids are seen holding the con posting. Star Trek is blatantly reinforcing the stereotype that Betazoids are unable to pilot starships. I think I've made my point. Anything can be misrepresented to support a narrative if you start with your conclusion and set out to find sexism, especially if you don't bother to actually learn about what you are complaining. How about we ask the opinion of someone else who actually plays the game? The gameplay! It's kind of simple and repetitive, but at the same time, I found it to be really enjoyable, satisfying, and surprisingly more deep than you might think. How about some of the playable characters? And there is a lot of them. Of course, there's some predictable ones like Link, Zelda, and Impa, all of which are fun. Then there's some more surprising ones like Midna, Fee, and... Agatha? The Bug Princess? I mean, I ain't no hater, but really? Agatha? Even when you first meet her, she's completely useless. Honestly, one of my favorite characters to play as, gameplay-wise, is the new character, Lana. She's just really fun and, frankly, straight-up awesome. And to boot, if she's using the Deku Spear, she can summon the Great Deku Tree to smash people to death. And that... Is just hilarious. But of all the great fairy designs they could have gone with, why did they have to use the absolute creepiest one? Ugh. 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 And if you can't trust what this guy thinks, then. But the worst, the worst part of this awful Zelda design, her intact, her attack involves her loincloth levitating upward while she pulls glowy energy out of her <laughs> out of her lady bit <laughs> I'm sorry I've never read that out loud before <laughs> oh, it's so ridiculous so thanks Nintendo for making me totally not at all regret that I haven't owned any Nintendo platform since the Game Boy Advance well that's the surprise of the century now isn't it for the purposes of this video, I tried to get a glimpse of Link's rear end, but it's as if his tunic is a high-tech piece of Hyrulean equipment designed to cover up his butt at all costs. Agatha's running animation does not match the speed at which she moves. I bet the patriarchy is responsible for this.